Cajun and Zydeco Music Festival. And the grass was green. And the Queen Mary was in the background. It was amazing. And of course, the ocean was blue as can be beyond that. And I'm standing at a stage looking up at this gorgeous musician. He is pumping his accordion like crazy and his muscle arms sweat is coming off his body and his, his Bruce Springsteen style headband is just drenched. Now I'm in love. Um, if some of you women don't like sweaty men, I've heard that, but if you've ever had that really slip and slide, sexy, wet sex, that's what I was thinking. This musician was Wayne Toops. Wayne Toops was a Cajun band that was flown in, and this is Cajun, and these are young white guys, flown in from Louisiana, and they are the headliners. And I dance out in front of the stage, you know, so he can see me. And at the break, I go backstage, because I'm on staff with the festival staff. I go backstage to the green room, and I chat him up. And he starts to go, oh, hey, girl, you, you're looking good down there. Oh, really? I just love your music. And blah, blah, blah. And then I get a picture sitting on his lap and, you know, real subtle flirting like that. Well, that night, all of the artists, the musicians, are staying in the same hotel. And around midnight, now I'm staying with my love interest at the time, Clint. He and I are staying in the room and he's gone to take a shower and the phone rings. Hey girl, you want some company? It's, it's Wayne. I, oh, uh, hey, nice to hear from you. Uh, no, I have somebody here already. All night? Yeah, I think it's gonna, it's gonna be all night. Sorry, I'm gonna have to catch you next time. Now, I'm, no, this was a booty call, and it might not be the first booty call of, of the night for him because it was that late. But if I hadn't been with Clint, I probably would have gone for it. So that didn't work out. But the next year, in 89, I see that Wayne Toops and Zyda Cajun is performing at the New Orleans Jazz Fest. And I've always wanted to go to Jazz Fest, so I call my girlfriend who lives in Lafayette, and we make arrangements to go. Before I leave, I talk to Clint. I say, Clint, is there anything I can get you in New Orleans? Because his band did. He says, well, you know, I need a new Neville Brothers t-shirt. My purple one's getting kind of faded. Okay, good. Well, I get to the fairgrounds. The festival grounds. It's like eight football fields. It's enormous. There are 12 stages. The grass is a little bit wet from a rain last night, but the smells of oh, beignets and barbecue and everything. So I know the Wayne is down at the Fado Do stage. I start heading down there, but then I pass this big, tall, handsome black man who's got a Neville Brothers t-shirt on. Oh, sorry, up, but I've been looking all over for that t-shirt. Can you tell me where, the, where you got it? And he looks at me kind of funny and he says, well, uh, I think you can get it at the merch booth. I think it's the next aisle over. So I trot on over the merch booth and I pick up a t-shirt for Clint and I'm going through the CDs of the Neville brothers. And I realized, oh my God, that big, tall, handsome man was Aaron Neville. I felt like such a, he must have thought I was an idiot. Well, I buzz on down to this Fado Do stage where Wayne is, and he's starting to play. And again, he's all sweaty and I'm liking that a lot. And I've danced down in front and kind of wave to him and he smiles and winks. So I think he recognizes me. And on the break, we start to talk. 
he says, well, we're playing down at Mulots tonight. Why don't you come on down and uh, we can hang out afterwards. Now, I was pretty sure hang out afterwards was code for something else, but I was up for it. Unfortunately, Terry, my girlfriend, called home to her boyfriend who was supposed to pick us up and he had to pick us up early. He, he's a, he was a roadie for Zachary Richard and there was some mix up on the scheduling anyway he had to go and he had to pick us up early. In those days there's no Uber, so, so no hanging out afterwards then. You think I'd give up, but six months later, Wayne's band is touring California, I notice, and I see that he's at Ashkenaz. It's a Berkeley nightclub, if you guys don't know. It's on San Pablo. It's well, well known. So I buy my ticket. I get there early. So I'm walking in the entrance. I see the big band bus pulled right out in front. I mean, it's shiny blue and it's the size of a greyhound. So I go in and I'm dancing, you know, in front of the band and he smiles at me. So again, I think he re remembers me. And on the first break, he invites me in, uh, into the bus with the band. They're gonna go sit in there and we sit in there and have some beers. It's, uh, you go in the front door and there's a, like a little kitchenette and then there's a little table there's some bench seating behind, and then there's some bunks in the back. So Wayne and I are sitting on the, at the little table and drinking the beers, and our knees are touching, so I'm start, starting to think, yeah, well, this might be going the way I was hoping. Well, those of you who know Ashkenaz know that they put their used bottles out in front for the recyclers to come. And there was a black guy coming to get some bottles. And now remember, these are white guys in the bus. They start laughing at him and making fun. I don't really understand the joke, but then somebody uses the N word. And I'm, nobody know, I know talks like that. And they all laugh and Wayne laughs. And I'm, I just slip off the bus. I don't know what to say, but I slipped out the bus and instead of going back inside, I walk across the street to the REI parking lot where everybody parks and I get in my car and go home. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this guy who I thought was really sexy and fabulous, he just now seems kind of small and cruel. And the idea of sexy, slippery, Sex with him sounds sort of nauseating. And you know, sometimes the road not taken is the best choice. <laughs> I've unmuted everyone, I think. You remuted us. Oh, <laughs> unmute. Oh. There we go. Um, Bravo. Yes. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice twist Thank to the you, end. <laughs> um, and now, I have a, a bit of a confession um, because this is my first time and I said we'd be recording this. I didn't start right at the top. And um, so forgive me for that, Claire. And then, um, Julius suggested, and he's master of, he knows a lot more about Zoom than I do. And I will put this to you, Claire, Sally, and Melissa, that he suggested that um, we all turn off our videos while you're telling, but I don't know how you feel about that. Um, do you like um, having the people there? Yes. Well, I, yeah. I usually like to see myself. Um, it gives me a little feedback. Yeah. What about, yeah, do you see other, the other people? This time, for some reason, all I saw was Ida with no pictures. So I don't know what that Oh, was. okay. I tried yeah, to ignore You may, may want to uh, uh, maybe go to gallery view. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, that was not worth it. 
Okay. So uh, to video. Uh, okay. Um, so what's what's the? Um, I like this view with the, the with people. The, with yeah. Speakers there, and then there's just a few at the top. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, so we will keep people on video. And then now, thank you, Claire. Our second teller is Melissa Holtz. And Melissa's story is titled 5-4-1970, When My Childhood Ended. And so um, give me a minute to mute everybody, and then we will start up again you will unmute yourself okay we're ready <clears throat> lately when i walk up solano avenue it's a ghost town of closed storefronts I only go out for coffee and groceries. And when I wait in the line, I can only see people's eyes. Everybody's muted. Uh, excuse me, everybody's shut off because of the virus. As my granddaughter likes to say, it's sick time, Gma, six feet apart. And all the university students have gone home taking their idealism with them to their legal social bubbles where they can remove their masks. And speaking of mask removal, now is a time of BLM when Black Lives Matter is revolutionizing our whole society. Things are off balance and we don't know where the center is. I continue walking up the sidewalk and I see the yellow dandelions and the fluff of the seeds that will blow away. And I think of my father and 50 years ago when injustice ended my childhood. Let me take you back to that time. There I am in high school math class right after lunch on a Thursday morning, a Thursday afternoon in May. The bell rings, it's announcements. It's Principal Palermo. Ladies and gentlemen, we will have a school assembly immediately. Please report to the auditorium. We never have assembly meetings on Mondays. So all 400 students are there waiting, anticipating as the principal climbs up the steps to the stage and walks to the podium. Ladies and gentlemen, we will be evacuating the entire school across the street at Kent State University. At least one student has been shot and killed by the National Guard. What? You will need to remove everything from your lockers for school will be closed for one to two weeks. Yay! Some cheer, others boo. What good is a vacation when somebody died? And you will go home with university employees. They will pick you up and take you the back way to your homes. And then I see the photograph of the 14 year old girl and think of the song by Neil Young. Tin soldiers and Nixon coming, we're finally on our own. Last summer I heard the drumming, four dead in Ohio, four dead in Ohio. So let me take you back to the last two weeks of my innocent childhood in Kent, Ohio, my hometown. It's April 22nd, 1970, and we have inaugurated the first Earth Day in U.S. history. I'm up there on the stage 
in front of all the students showing slides of all the local factories and their waste pipes dumping into the Cuyahoga River pollution, the river that burned in Cleveland in the 1960s. I'm working at a recycling place with all my friends where we're cracking the blue, brown, and clear glass with our hammers to consolidate it. And I'm stalking and eating wild foods for high school credit, ah, Yule Gibbons, so that if all heck breaks loose, I can survive. And I get an army jacket from my boyfriend at the local coffee house. But when I take it to my field hockey practice, all the girls shun me. There's a polarization between those in favor of Vietnam and those opposed to Vietnam. Friday, May 1st, 1970, President Robert White of Kent State University issues a permit for the high college students to rally against the war noon on Monday in the lush grassy fields at the center commons of the university. And then on Saturday, I taste my first fondue at a dinner for family and friends. We're dipping broccoli into cheesy sauce. And we're dipping strawberries into liquid chocolate recounting our U.S. president revealing his secret weapon to end the Vietnam War was bombing Cambodia, a fact that he had held secret for months. My dad is driving home, and I look up in the sky, and it's light, not lightning. No, it's red, and it's big. Something's on fire. Dad, Hurry home. Okay, we get home, we turn on the TV. Protesters, student protesters at Kent State University have caught the Razi building on fire. The governor is in Kent at this time to deal with the situation. And then the governor is there pounding on the mayor's desk. These student revolutionaries are bound and determined to ruin higher education. I'm going to eradicate this problem. I'm going to rescind that permit for them to rally on Monday. And I'm gonna call in the National Guard to deal with it. You, Mr. Mayor, you convey that to the president. I'm out of here. I didn't feel sleepy after that. I walked out of the house, down the driveway, crossed the road to the other side and looked up at the North Star next to the farmer's gate. And I turned around and looked back towards Kent when the flames were leaping 40 feet high. And I thought of all the students looking out of their dorm room windows at the flames and the reflection of the flames on the Greek columns of all the classrooms wondering what's happening to our university. And then the firefighters are coming in with their hoses and strangers come out of the night and poke holes in the hoses. They're dead on the ground. The ROTC building burns to the ground. And I look up to the North Star and I say, I wasn't raised this way. Why are these students believing this? We're not supposed to use justice, uh, fight, violence to create justice. How could they do this to me? It's not gonna bring the boys home. It's not gonna end the war. But of course, the North Star didn't say anything. Next day, it's Sunday, and my dad is driving home after church. Melissa, I'm gonna stop by my office to get some supplies before my botany class on Monday. I'm going to be dissecting Taraxicum officinale with my students. Dad? Daddy lions. You know, they're on every continent on earth. You see, my dad was a botany professor, and from the time I was five years old, he used to run up to me and chatter the Latin name of some weed. He liked weeds more than vegetables. 
Then come the next day, Monday, May 4th, 1970, 6.30 a.m. Yes, this is President Robert White. I would like you to print 12,000 flyers and have them ready by 9 a.m. What is it going to say? Do not come to the rally. The governor has rescinded the permit. Well, don't you worry about how I'm gonna get them distributed. I'm just now calling the professors, the assistants, the secretaries, we'll get it distributed. Some students saw the flyers, some didn't. Some who saw the flyers said, wait, that's my first amendment rights. I'm showing up. Now advance to noon, May 4th. 2,000 students on one side, 75 National Guard on the other. Now, some of these National Guard chose to work there instead of going and doing their service in Vietnam. They were local boys, and they probably knew some of the university students. But it's 12 noon. Attention, students. This is an illegal assembly. Please disperse immediately, or we will take further action. And on the other hand, is the chief peacekeeper from my church, Glenn Frank. Students, I don't care if you've never listened to anyone before in your life, please disperse now or they will shoot you. Jesus Christ, I don't want to be here. The National Guard threw tear gas. Some students picked up the canisters and lobbed them back, which was considered aggression. When the volley began, some students thought that they were just rubber bullets. But when they heard the pinging of live rounds, they took cover. And 13 seconds later, 12 had died. 12 had been shot and four died. Who was I to follow now? I'd been alienated by the students when the ROTC building burned. And now, what was I to think of the authorities who killed people? to try to keep order? My childhood had caught fire when the ROTC building burned, and then it burned to the ground when those four students died. And then Mother Nature took her course. Two days later, there was a killing frost in all the farmers' fields around Kent. And July 4th that summer, there was a tornado which blew through Kent. And yet, even after all that unsettlement in the summer, by the fall in our school, the dress code was gone. The girls could wear their skirts all the way up to their buns, and the guys had their hair down to their shoulders and their sideburns down to their jaws. And I was still wearing my army jacket. Nobody seemed to be bothered. Except one day I was walking on the sidewalk and a man comes up, rolls down his window and he says, you're a hippie. I could have you arrested for impersonating a military person. And I wanted to say, my governor lied to me. And my president lied to me. And you want to arrest me? Go ahead. But I said nothing. And then a month later, all the factories which dumped their pollution into Kent agreed they would stop dumping the waste. So I took off my army jacket. Why wear it now? I'd achieved what I wanted. Now, in place of my childhood innocence, there was a skepticism. And now, 50 years later, I've been living with skepticism. And I'm thinking, how much have we advanced? We've made some advancements for the environment, but there's a global crisis of extinction among the animals and plants, and we have global climate change. And our First Amendment rights have again been curtailed to perfect from the COVID virus. And yet, the tragedy of another Black man dying at the hands of the police has evoked such catastrophic changes around the world that all the stumbling blocks of racism have turned into stepping stones towards justice. President Obama talked about hope and change. 
Right now we have a lot of change, but I'm hoping we will gather our hope as well. And I remember Howard Beale, you know, remember that movie, Network? I'm as mad as hell and I'm not gonna take it anymore. We're right there, we're right there. And it reminds me of the song by Bob Dylan that I'd like you to look at the words and maybe sing with me. <clears throat> How many times must a man look up before he can see the sky? Yes, and how many ears must one man have before he can hear people cry? Yes, and how many deaths will it take till he knows that too many people have died? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. And I'm reminded again, as I walk up Solano Avenue, of the yellow dandelions and their white fluff, which is spreading seeds all over North Berkeley. And as my dad talked about dandelions all over the continents of Earth, there are major changes happening, which are giving us the hope that we will have the changes needed to reestablish harmony in a new world. Oh, Melissa. Oh, my goodness. That was a tour de force. How you covered those elements of history and just wove them together in such a short time. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Great job. I love that walk down memory lane. Man, that was powerful. Thank you to StageBridge for uh, giving us these opportunities to reveal ourselves, reveal our feelings. <laughs> Thanks, Melissa. I joined you late. It's Marion. Oh, hi, Marion. Wherever yeah. you are. Yeah, my picture isn't there, but I'm here. I'm here. And I love you and wonderful. Oh, I'm thank glad you. are in my family. Marion is my uh, granddaughter's great g <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for that wonderful story, Melissa. And um, we are now going to change tack and invite Sally Holtzman um, to tell her story. And Sally's story has a very intriguing, for me, uh, title, Forever Event. So let me mute all and then Sally can get started. Sally, you need to unmute yourself. There. Is yep. it all right? Hello, hello? Yes. You're good, Sally. Okay. Except I don't, I just have me in a little picture and you're in the big picture. Doesn't make any difference. Should I start? Yes. Okay, all right. Just <clears throat> please mute. All right, here we go. A delightful sight greeted me the other morning as I walked my dog, Oliver Wendell Holmes, in the neighborhood. Um, my neighbor had put a banner hanging from the second story of her house 
and it was painted in wonderful summer colors, um, pink and blue and lime green and orange. And it was festooned with balloons and streamers. And it said in letters about that big, happy 10th birthday, Maggie. And all morning I heard from my house horns honking as they passed that house. And sometimes a pedestrian would walk by and shout, happy birthday, Maggie. And I thought, this is probably not the birthday that little girl wanted, but she will never forget it. Not even if she lives to be as old as I am. Because you see, I had a 10th birthday that I still remember. Now, I have never met Maggie's mother, um, but I think she must be a very uh, enthusiastic woman who loves to entertain and give parties. This does not describe my mother. My mother was small and shy and very reserved, and her idea of a birthday party was to invite my Aunt Mina and my Uncle Ben to the house have dinner, make a chocolate cake, put the appropriate amount of candles on it, bring the lighted cake to the table, have everybody sing happy birthday, have me blow out the candles, and then open the one birthday present for my aunt and uncle. That was my birthday celebration. I had been to other people's birthday, other children's birthdays. You know, I had played blind man's buff and, and pinned the tail on the donkey. I had a party dress, I had party shoes, but I had never had a birthday party. And I was determined that I would have a 10th birthday party. So my birthday is in August 20th. And so at the, as July rolled around on that year of my 10th birthday, I decided I would make a concerted campaign to have a 10th, a 10th birthday party. And when my mother and I went to the Piggly Wiggly Market, I would push the cart very slowly down the paper aisle. <gasps> mama, mama, look at these paper goods. Look, there's a birthday plate and birthday cups and napkins and table cloth. Mama, mama, if we bought that, you wouldn't have to clean up after my birthday. Isn't it beautiful? Very nice, Sally. And when we passed the bakery shop, I'd look in the window. Oh, Mama, look. Look at that birthday cake. Isn't it beautiful? Mama, we could buy a birthday cake. You wouldn't even have to bake a birthday cake. It's very nice, Sally. Well, July came and went, and now it was August, and there was no talk of my birthday party. So one night at dinner, I just started to cry great big old crocodile tears falling into the mashed potatoes. And my daddy looked at me. Sally Joy, whatever is the matter with you? Oh, daddy, daddy, I want a birthday party so badly, daddy. Can I have a birthday party, please? And my father looked at my mother and my mother looked at my father. And my father covered my mother's hand with his and he said, don't worry, honey. I will give Sally the birthday party. What? My father is going to give me a birthday party. My father is a very important man in town. He wears a suit and a tie every day. My father was raised in an orphanage. He doesn't even know how to play. And the next day it got worse. My father brought home stationery from the spinning mill that he ran. Now a spinning mill is a mill that converts cotton into thread. And it was a very, very large mill, it must have had two or 300 employees. And he brought this stationery and it said, Threads Incorporated founded in 1930. I looked at my dad, daddy, this is stationery. This is an invitations. I know, Sally, we are having your birthday party at the mill. At the mill, at the mill. No one was going to come to my birthday party in a birthday dress. Donald, the only boy to be invited, would not wear long pants because my father wrote at the bottom of these invitations, please have your child wear play clothes. August 20th came. My daddy and I drove over to the mill 
and the other children were at the door. My daddy unlocked the door to the mill and we went up the stairs to his office. My daddy unlocked the door. I was dreading, dreading when that door opened. What would everybody say? The door to the office opened and it was full of balloons. There were balloons everywhere. Balloons on the bookcases, balloons tied to chairs, balloons on the Venetian blinds, and on the desk, the big oak desk, everything had been removed. And there was the birthday tablecloth and the plates and the cups. And in the center, there was the cake. My mother had been there. And then my father took off his coat. He put down his tie and he said, come on children, let's go play. And he opened up the the room, the adjoining room, which was the conference room. And it usually had a great big table, but the table was all gone. Instead, the chairs were still around as though the table was there. And on each chair was a great big spool of thread. And my daddy gave each one of us a spool of thread. And he said, now children, listen, attach the piece of thread to a chair, and then we are going to make the most beautiful, the biggest, the most colorful spider web that ever was in the whole world. Are you ready? Go. And we began to let out that thread and it went back and forth and back and forth and over the chairs and around the chairs and under the chairs. Stop. And we looked and wouldn't you know, stretched across all these chairs was the world's biggest and most beautiful spider web. And then daddy caught up Donald. Donald? You are the spider and all these girls are flies. Go get them. And Donald chased us all around the room until the spider web fell at our ankles. All right, come on, we're gonna go to the slide. And daddy took us out to the mezzanine. And for a moment we stopped and looked out at that factory floor, the floor of the mill, where the spinning machines just marched down one after the other like a platoon of soldiers. And it was so quiet. You know, it's a huge, huge factory. It's so quiet because a spinning mill is very noisy when it runs. It goes, zzz, zzz, but it was just quiet. And the sun was coming in through the windows and catching specks of cotton in the air and they shone like silver. Daddy said, come on, let's go. And we walked over to a great big tin slide. Now in this mill, the, the bales of cotton were brought up to the mezzanine floor. And as they were needed, they were pushed down this slide to the main floor. The slide must have been at least a story and a half high. It was huge, huge. And daddy collapsed, collapsed a, a box, put Donald on it and gave him a push. Shoo, down he flew to the, to the main floor. And then each girl went after, down we went. Then we came back up the stairs and we went down in twos and we went down in threes and we went down singing, we went down clapping. It was so much fun. It was like a big ride in an amusement park. And finally tired, daddy said, come on, let's go and have some refreshments. And we went into the office and daddy poured us lemonade. And then he lit the candles on the cake and everybody sang happy birthday. And then daddy cut the cake like a daddy should, giving everybody an outside piece with lots and lots of frosting. And then after everybody had eaten and had their lemonade, I opened my presents one after the other, after the other, after the other. And then I gave everybody who came to the party a present in token. And then the birthday was over. And we went down the stairs to the parking lot. I just floated down the stairs, floated down the stairs. Whoever had a better birthday than I? I knew that I would never, never remember, never, never forget that birthday. And I never have, even as old as I am. Happy birthday, Maggie! Happy birthday! There we go. <laughs> oh.
Oh, Sally. Ah. Bravo. Oh. That was wonderful. Oh. Yeah. Fabulous. <laughs> Sally, you're the best. <laughs> Absolute treat. Mm -hmm. Sally, I've always loved that story and how you've even made it better and better. That's the art of telling. Thank you. Yeah, I, it, I, it's an old story with me. I'm sure most of you have already heard it, but when I was trying to think about what I should tell, um, and then I saw that poster, that, that banner the other day, and I thought, aha, here it is. <laughs> so, yeah. What a treat to get to hear this. Thank you. Yes, I'm delighted. I what a treat that was. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, wonderful story. And you have oh. a birthday coming up soon, then. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we replicate it? <laughs> oh, yes, we can. <laughs> Good. Well, uh, I'd like to ask our tellers, do you have any other um, events coming up that you'd like to announce to yes. us? You have a, you know, uh, audience out here, and if you're doing something, please let us all know. Claire? Uh, yes. I don't have anything uh, upcoming. Um, I'll probably be doing a um, showcase with... Um, with one of my teachers, but uh, I don't know when that is yet, so. Okay, Melissa, do you have something coming up? Um, yeah, I'm telling uh, two stories at the Marsh in Berkeley on Monday evening. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, and maybe you can send that out to everyone. Okay. We can join. And Sally, what about you? Sal, and we have the Contra Costa Tailspinner Swap coming up next Thursday. Hope you all come. If you want to tell, you need to uh, contact Liz Nichols. And let's see, how can I get, um, is there anybody, how can I get a link to them? Uh, uh, to Type it uh, into chat. Type it yeah. into chat. Ah, okay. Okay, I'll try to do that. Let me find my glasses. <laughs> yeah, so we have, you know, about six more minutes. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um give everyone the opportunity i have a hard uh deadline at one so i'm but i'm going to just oh you're gone we missed you Clara, you're muted Clara, you're muted muted Muted. Oh, sorry so uh, i'll be back in a few minutes but uh, just um, go off camera and let people have the opportunity to visit for a few minutes i'll be back in about five minutes. Oh. Did everyone oh, look, catch that? Lois. I see Lois. Hey. hey. Lois. I haven't seen Hi, Lois. Lois. It's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah, it's it's good, good to see, see everybody's you. face. Yeah. Yours were wonderful. I mean, really, I'm looking forward to my turn. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, I'm going to sign off, folks. Good Bye, to Claire. see you all. Good to see you again, Claire. Yes. Oh, yeah, Agnes. <laughs> Agnes, I do like your hair. Though. It's I growing. Think. I just, you know, by you default, like <laughs> I'm scared to go get it cut. So. Yeah, understandably. <laughs> Thank you. All right. See you guys. Okay. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everyone. Oh, what a good Bye-bye, everyone. Good. 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 To get involved in uh, storytelling, if you can. Um, you know, you get to be in the limelight and tell your story, and um, it's a wonderful experience. It is. We, we are blessed to be in this. Yes. Blessed to be with everyone. And we all have these stories. Oh, these were just delicious. And what a variety. Thank you. Each of you. And they, we're blessed they, to they have this outlet, really this outlet, the ability to communicate and see each other's face. I, I just can't, it just really amazes me. I'm so thankful for it. Yeah. Um, Y'all, how do I, how do I make this chat? It says, to, it says, click on chat. Click on chat. And yeah, click on that thing that says chat. I did it, but it, it gave bottom. me a private number, a private. Yeah, then go up to everyone. Scroll oh. up so it says to everyone. All right, hold on.
Do you so, want to chat to everyone or somebody in particular? No, I want every, everyone. Everyone, because she's going to give us a link. Oh, that's right. I'm not. It's not working. Okay, um, I can I can uh, put Liz's email in there. I yeah, think. would you do that for me, please? Yes. Thank you so much. And you say what they need to do. Just to uh, send uh, a, a message to Liz and ask um, for the notice for tail spinners. Well done, Susan. Wow. Thank you. Easy when you know how. <laughs> thank you so much. Yay. Uh, again, uh, to the tellers, I just want to say thank you so much. That was really wonderful. Um, everybody else, stay tuned. We'll be back in August. Great. Um, and uh, same in the same fashion, we'll we'll you know send out the the link and um, tell everyone, invite more people. Um, and thanks again for being so supportive of lunchtime storytelling. We really, really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Claire. Thank you for being here, keeping the place going. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. And uh, everybody stay safe. Stay safe. You too. Thank you all too. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.